Jeffrey Daniels pretended to review his speech. It was only the eighth day of the conference, and he wasn't scheduled to speak until the 14th day. But he felt more secure when he had something to do. He used a heavy pen emblazoned in chip gold lettering with the words Heaven World History Conference to point to each word as he mouthed it. He knew the speech was bad, but he wasn't willing to rewrite it. He wasn't even sure how he would correct it, because if he was honest about it, the entire conference didn't quite make sense to him. A woman squeezed past his legs. As she sat down next to Jeffrey, she tugged her short gray skirt underneath her, but Jeffrey could still see a triangle of her thighs. He decided then that he would like to fuck her, there in the auditorium, on the stage maybe, with the velvet curtains twisting around their skin. Because of exactly this type of fantasy, Jeffrey had been only five points away from missing the cutoff for heaven. Don't worry about the score, St. Peter had told him at the pearly gates, which had been redone to resemble a toll booth. This isn't the SATs. All that matters is whether you're in or you're out. And you're in. The speakers in the auditorium squealed with artificial feedback, and everyone clapped delightedly, like people watching fireworks. God, dressed in a white linen suit, was standing at the wood laminate podium, about to speak. If Jeffrey had died just a few years earlier, he would have arrived at pearly gates whiter than anything he'd seen on earth and glistening like sun-touched surf. As it was, he'd shown up at the height of new realism. Andy Warhol had started it, he was told, though others said the true founder was an unknown Russian man. Either way, after millennia of halos and shimmering robes, the population of heaven had been hungry for a new aesthetic and new realism flourished. People who had once lived in gold brick palaces now conjured as seen on TV kitchen gadgets, hideous faces, and vast stretches of plastic shelving. Those who died and stayed young, many of them plague victims, wore buttons on their messenger bags that said, in heaven as it is on earth. Roaming the streets of clapboard houses, some with garden gnomes perched outside. Jeffrey had been deeply disappointed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth day of the Heaven World History Conference, God said in a deep, enthralling tone that reminded Jeffrey of a famous magician he'd been taking to see as a child. The conference was supposed to be an effort at producing peace on Earth, but Jeffrey suspected the real reason for it was to give God a stage. He was a born politician. Well, not actually born, Jeffrey reminded himself. The total lack of need for governance in heaven, however, meant he had few opportunities to exercise his rhetorical skills. Jeffrey had received the invitation about three weeks after he'd died. The idea was that each person, one from each generation, would tell his or her life story before an audience of the still living creating an appreciation of diversity and of the disastrous effects of war. This, to Jeffrey, seemed unlikely. But with God as an organizer, it was impossible to turn down the invitation. According to rumor, God had originally wanted to bring all of the world's leaders, but after some worried remarks from a group of archangels, had settled for a collection of third-tier officials and diplomats, he hoped would be important enough to carry back the message, but not important enough to be missed. These officials sat on a balcony that overhung the rear of the auditorium, watching God the way one might look at a person with an incomprehensible accent who is delivering important instructions. Jeffrey wished he could do something for them, sneak up there and comfort them somehow, but he wasn't willing to miss his chance with the woman sitting next to him. I even have a broken spring in my chair, the woman whispered to Jeffrey with obvious pride. Jeffrey briefly reconsidered his desire to sleep with her. 
At first, he had just felt cheated by heaven's lack of grammar, glamour. But now, new realism and its adherence infuriated him. He particularly hated the replica ceramic angel figurines that were currently the latest fad because of their ironic brilliance. His grandmother had had the real thing on her mantle. The woman shifted in her seat and her silk camisole draped open, revealing the tops of her breasts. Yeah, that feedback was sure something, Jeffrey said. The day's first speaker, a British man from the 1100s named Aslan Sloper, had taken the podium. Like all of the speakers who'd come before him, Aslan Sloper began with a heart-wrenching story from his childhood. Jeffrey didn't pay much attention, but it seemed to involve a peasant, who was possibly the speaker's cousin, being trampled. Jeffrey had no heart-wrenching stories to tell from his childhood. He remembered very clearly the day that he had dribbled mucus-like strands of rubber cement onto a girl named Kelsey's waist-length blonde hair during nap time. But he was fairly certain that hearing about the way the entire classroom smelled like a gas station afterwards, or how he felt when Kelsey came in the next day with a pixie cut, would not make the living return to Earth with a better idea of the pathway to world peace. In fact, he didn't think anything from his life would. Suddenly, a cool breeze broke through the stale auditorium air. Jeffrey looked to the door, but didn't see anything. Then he noticed that a man surrounded by swirling folds of gleaming white fabric and a nearly hypnotic display of feathers was materializing through the dimly illuminated exit sign. For goodness sake, Gabriel, there's no need to make such a show, God said, interrupting Aslan Slipper, who was still talking about his possible cousin. Gabriel was one of the few archangels who still held to traditional notions about heaven. And though Jeffrey had never seen him before, he'd always felt they shared a certain affinity. Almighty Lord, Alpha and Omega, Gabriel said, I bring grave tidings. News such as I bring seizes the notes of joyous hymns from the air and throws them laid bare upon the ground. God retrieved a yellow legal pad from his briefcase. Go on now, he prodded. Gabriel looked surprised for a moment, and Jeffrey suspected that he had forgotten to plan his address beyond the opening remarks. He was, however, saved from the need to continue by the appearance of St. Peter, who arrived with his face red and his glasses crooked, making him look to Jeffrey like an overexcited comic book aficionado. They're here, St. Peter shouted asthmatically. Who's here, Peter? asked God. Humanity, they've all arrived to be judged. God looked at St. Peter with an expression of patient incomprehension. You did tell him, didn't you? St. Peter asked Gabriel. Gabriel said, I had not yet arrived at the center of the matter in my report. Well, St. Peter looked smug, as if a deep-seated prejudice of his had just been confirmed. Here it is, then. Some French physicists were attempting to create a black hole-like phenomenon. Unfortunately, they created an actual black hole, and, well, I guess there's no easy way to say it. The world was consumed. The officials on the balcony began to shriek. They surged against each other, slamming their bodies up against the railing. Oh, God said. He looked out at the audience, and his face seemed suddenly childish. His large, bushy eyebrows looked as though they had been stuck on with costume adhesive. Jeffrey thought about the house where he'd grown up. He remembered the gurgling sound of the heater at night and how, when he couldn't sleep, he had pretended it was the gentle flow of a stream. The streams were gone, too, he realized. He thought about his last apartment and the poster he'd had of a naked woman hiding her breasts behind an Eiffel Tower that came up to her shoulders. All of Paris lay around her feet, the Seine like a hesitantly dropped bra. Geoffrey had never been to Paris, and now he thought there was no Paris. 
After a long silence, God said into the microphone, I claim full responsibility for the unfortunate destruction of the earth today. He looked up at the Heaven World History Conference banner above his head. Obviously, world peace is no longer a concern, he said, and so the rest of this conference will be canceled. There are refreshments in the lobby for anyone who's interested. <laughs> the balcony was still in chaos, but the lower floor was quiet as women untangled purse straps from the backs of chairs and people patiently waited for the aisles to clear. Jeffrey stood up and let himself be pulled along by the shuffle of bodies. Jeffrey wished that he had been to Paris. He also wished he had been to London, which was also no longer there. Walmart was no longer there. The Chinese restaurant with the smiling pig painted on the window was no longer there. God was still on the stage talking to St. Peter. His voice was accidentally picked up by the microphone. I just can't bring myself to do it all again, he said. I'm not sure I even remember how to make some things. St. Peter nodded sympathetically. Like drafts, God said. I have no idea how to make a draft anymore. It's okay, said St. Peter. The world never really needed drafts in the first place. A voice cracked through the speakers. I fell in love for the first time in the year 1154, Aslan Slipper announced, reading from his notes. Jeffrey was pushed out into the lobby. He saw the woman who had been sitting next to him reaching for a muffin. She took a bite, and a crumb got caught in her glossy red lipstick. Don't you care? Jeffrey asked. She looked at Jeffrey closely for a moment. I just think it will have such interesting implications for new realism, she said, overly enthusiastic, as if she were speaking to someone very ill. I mean, what happens when you have a form of art modeled after a world which no longer exists? This is a real opportunity for innovation. Things mattered there, Jeffrey said. It was real. Yes, but what is reality? See, that's what new realism is all about. Jeffrey turned away from her and started elbowing his way back to the auditorium door. The lobby was filled with chattering people making broad gestures. They wielded powdered donuts, which spewed white sugar into the air. A shame in any case, he heard someone say. The lower floor of the auditorium was empty now. God and St. Peter sat together on the stage, their legs dangling over the edge as if they were children on bar stools. St. Peter chewed thoughtfully on the cap of a ballpoint pen. Alone at the podium, Aslan Sloper finished his speech. The microphone had been turned off, but his voice still carried through the empty auditorium. Thank you very much, he said. Jeffrey brought his hands together and applauded. It was all he could do. When he stopped clapping, Jeffrey heard God ask, but what about naked mole rats? Thank you.